Hello and welcome to this presentation of Pakistan's Prevention of Trafficking in Persons Act of 2018. My name is Andrea Schlonhardt and I will take you through the purpose and main content of this legislation and also briefly talk about the background that led to the enactment of this important piece of law in the year 2018. Pakistan first legislated on the topic of trafficking in persons, or human trafficking as it's sometimes referred to, in 2002 when the then General Musharraf passed the Prevention and Control of Human Trafficking Ordinance. This piece of law was clearly inspired by the United Nations Protocol to prevent, suppress and punish trafficking in persons, but also departed from the international template in some important points. It did criminalize human trafficking in various forms, but had several important shortcomings in relation to attempting this crime, in relation to the consent of victims, and the topic of trafficking in persons was not covered well in this ordinance. PACTO, as the ordinance is often referred to, was complemented in 2004 by the Prevention and Control of Human Trafficking Rules, which set out the investigative and prosecution procedures and various mechanisms relating to the assistance, protection and repatriation of victims of trafficking. However, it too had serious shortcomings regarding the identification of victims, victim support was very limited, and victims also face great bureaucratic hurdles to access any support. Furthermore, the rules did not provide for any meaningful participation of victims in criminal proceedings against their traffickers. For these reasons and because of these serious shortcomings, PACTO and these rules were repealed in June 2018 and replaced with the new Prevention of Trafficking in Persons Act of 2018. This new legislation is clearly inspired and follows much more closely the United Nations Trafficking in Persons Protocol, a global instrument that sets standards for states to criminalize and combat trafficking in persons. Other regions around the world have enacted their own frameworks to combat trafficking in persons. This includes the Council of Europe, ASEAN in Southeast Asia, but also the South Asian countries have concluded the Convention on Preventing and Combating Trafficking in Women and Children some years ago. It is on this background that calls have, are quite long-standing in Pakistan to enact comprehensive laws against trafficking in persons and substitute PACTO. Already in 2010, a bill to change the law was introduced into Parliament. In 2013, the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime reviewed Pakistan's national laws and then drafted the new statute, which led to the enactment of the Prevention of Trafficking in Persons Act in 2018. The purpose of this act is to provide effective measures to prevent and combat trafficking in persons, especially women and children who are most affected by this crime type. The preamble of the Act also states that one key goal is to promote and facilitate national and international cooperation and to protect victims of trafficking in persons. The key features of this Act, which I will highlight multiple times throughout this brief presentation, is to criminalize and to punish the organizers and the traffickers. Furthermore, the legislation serves to protect victims of trafficking. It is certainly not the goal to criminalize victims as many earlier statutes have done in the past. Trafficking in persons is an offense under section 3, subsection 1 of the Prevention of Trafficking in Persons Act. Trafficking consists of three main elements, the act, the means and the purpose of trafficking. The act involves conduct such as recruiting, harboring, transporting or obtaining another person. The means of trafficking involves the use of fraud or fraud or coercion, including threats of harm or physical restraint, abuse of a position of vulnerability 
or psychological pressure put on the victim. The third element is the purpose of trafficking, which may be compelled labor, such as servitude, slavery, and so on, or commercial sexual acts. These are the constituent features of trafficking in persons. One important point that is not an element of trafficking in persons is the consent of the victim, which is not relevant to lay charges under this act. It does mean that a victim may indeed consent to their journey, to the transfer, or even to the harsh conditions that are associated with their employment. This does not matter for the liability of the traffickers. What is required is that the means of trafficking are established, which in an indirect way bring in the situation of the victim and the lack of freedom of choice they may have. The new Act of 2018 sets out three basic criminal offences. First, there is the offence of trafficking in persons under Section 3, Subsection 1, that relates mostly to men. It needs to be established that the trafficker committed one of the acts of trafficking, used one of the means that we've just explored, and had the purpose to exploit this person through compelled labour or commercial sexual services. Subsection 2 of Section 3 sets out a separate offence for trafficking in women, where the added element is proof that the victim of this crime was a female. A third offence concerns the trafficking in children. Here the offence is slightly altered, where the victim is a child under the age of 18, the act and the purpose need to be established, but the means element is no longer required, which made it significantly easier to establish liability under this offence, and it means that children are largely not required as witnesses or to prove any of these elements. This is an important tool also to protect children. These three basic offences are aggravated and the penalty is raised in any of the following circumstances. Where the victim is seriously injured, where their life is threatened, or they contract an illness, where they die as a result of the trafficker's conduct, or where organized criminal groups are involved. The offense is also aggravated where traffickers confiscate or destroy the travel documents of the victim, or where they offend multiple times. Liability under these three offences is further extended to attempting to traffic, where perhaps the trafficking is, does not materialise and police stop people in their way. Extended also to participation as an accomplice or abetting or to a criminal conspiracy to traffic. One important aggravating feature I want to reiterate at this point is the involvement of organized criminal group in trafficking in persons. This term is defined in the Act as a structured group of two or more persons existing for a period of time and acting in concert with the aim of committing any of the trafficking offenses in order to obtain directly or indirectly a financial or other material benefit. While this definition requires the group to have some sort of structure and cohesiveness, it is not required that they are a syndicate or mafia-style organization. It suffices if they are a loose network of perpetrators sharing this particular aim. If an organized criminal group is involved in trafficking, then this means that an aggravation kicks in, such that the penalty is raised to imprisonment of up to 3 and 14 years. Just as there are aggravations and extensions to liability, there are also exemptions and limitations, in particular concerning the liability of victims of trafficking. Importantly, Section 6 of the Act says that the victim shall not be criminally liable for an offence under this Act. There may only be a witness. 
This is important because it means victims cannot and will not be criminally liable for seeking to contact traffickers for transportation. They are also not liable as participants in the traffickers' offence. The focus, as we heard at the outset, is on the traffickers and their criminal liability, not on the victims of trafficking. Victims may, however, be liable under other statutes, but not under the Prevention of Trafficking in Persons Act. Let me illustrate how the offences under this offence to operate with a simple case example. It involves a female who is trafficked from Pakistan to Saudi Arabia. She is recruited by a person offering her employment in the domestic um, sector in Saudi Arabia. And to obtain that employment and the transfer to Saudi Arabia, the woman pays the recruiter a sum of money. She then starts her journey to Saudi Arabia and is stopped at the border. Here, the person organizing her journey demands further payment beyond what was agreed. She, her vulnerability is exploited. She is deceived about the real circumstances of her journey to the other country. Having paid the additional money, she moves on to Saudi Arabia where her passport is confiscated by the person who is her employment or perhaps offering her accommodation. You can see with the three persons highlighted here in red that trafficking in person seeks to criminalize all the aspects involved in what is often a long journey from the place of origin to the destination. The case here illustrates a case of cross-border trafficking but it is important to note that the legislation also covers trafficking that occurs entirely within the borders of Pakistan. For example, the trafficking of persons from rural to urban areas for the purpose of exploitation. Beyond criminalization, an important feature of this statute is the protection of victims of trafficking. They are victims of a crime who require protection and assistance. And Section 11 of the new statute contains several measures to protect victims and other persons at risk and to safeguard them for also by protecting their identity, whereabouts and so on. Section 13 also envisages compensations for victims of trafficking by making reference to Section 445 of the Penal Code of Pakistan. Just as victims may be victims of a crime, they may also be witnesses of these crimes who are important for law enforcement purposes. For this reason, Section 11 contains specific measures to protect victims as witnesses. And Section 12 also notes the special protection mechanisms that are important in judicial proceedings to protect their identity, for instance, by having um, in camera, that is, closed proceedings, or restrict access to records so that traffickers cannot um, identify the victims. Lastly, what are the implications for law enforcement? The Federal Investigation Agency has a mandate under Section 8 for trafficking by way of transportation into and out of Pakistan, the cross-border form of trafficking. The provincial police, on the other hand, has the mandate for domestic trafficking, for the exploitation of foreign workers in Pakistan or for harboring victims of trafficking. Because of this split mandate between the FIA and provincial police, cooperation and coordination is key, and this also involves cooperation with agencies across borders if the victim is trafficked into or out of Pakistan. Let me summarize the key points. The purpose of the new Prevention of Trafficking in Persons Act is to criminalize and punish organizers and traffickers and to protect victims and witnesses of trafficking. 
Trafficking in persons has an act, a means, and a purpose element that need to be established to hold people criminally liable. This offence is simplified if the victim is a child. Aggravations apply where the victim is killed or harmed if the documents are taken away or, importantly, if organised criminal groups are involved. The consent and the lack of consent of the victim are not relevant. The focus is on the traffickers and their criminal liability. This concludes this short summary of the Prevention of Trafficking in Persons Act 2018 of Pakistan. Thank you very much for your attention.